Once again, good morning and welcome to Community Christian Church. It's so good to have you with us. Don't look now, but it's been about a month and a half since we've been on lockdown. Locked in our homes and locked out of church. And even though I'm the eternal optimist, and from my perspective, there's always a silver lining somewhere, still I'll be the first to admit, over the past couple of weeks, it's been hard to maintain a positive attitude. Like I mentioned last week, I'm cleaning bathrooms and doing housework for Pete's sake. And I'm preaching into cameras. And after 45 years, instead of being in church, I'm at home watching church on TV. And if that's not enough, I'm getting fat. I'm putting weight on. And there's nothing I can do about it. And I know they say that video adds about 10 pounds. Unfortunately, this is not the camera. This is me. And I've been on a diet every Monday for the last five weeks, and it's not working. But all kidding aside, through it all, through all the struggles and all the disappointments and through all the challenges, God is speaking to his people. God is speaking very clearly and I have been hearing the voice of God. And you know what I mean by that? Not an audible voice, but the Spirit's prompting. And it's not like all of a sudden God is in a talking mood. No, God talks all the time. But because of what's happening and because my life has dramatically slowed down, I'm in a much better position to hear God speak. And make no mistake, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is saying some things, and I, for one, do not want to miss this visitation. And I know you don't as well, and I sincerely appreciate you opening your hearts to the Word of God and saying, God, what's in it for me today? What are you trying to say to me today? And I pray that the Lord will speak to you, every single heart. All right, at this time, I'd like to share a portion of Scripture found in the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. But just before we do that, most of you know that today, the first Sunday in May, is Mission Sunday. And we've been having Mission Sunday here at our church for the past seven or eight years, maybe even longer. On Mission Sunday, we receive a special offering to finance our mission budget for the entire year. And our goal this year, the same as it was last year, is to raise $100,000 for missions, for world missions and local outreach. Well, with everything that's going on, we decided to postpone Mission Sunday and reschedule it for later in the year. But in the meantime, we still want to provide the same financial support to all of our mission and outreach partners, somewhere right around $5,000 a month. And so our goal is to not miss a single payment because this pandemic is not just in the United States, it's global, and there's a lot of hurting people. And so we want to continue to pass along the same mission support that we always do. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do your best to save a little mission money and hold on to it until we schedule Mission Sunday later in the year. The suggested contribution Again, the same as last year, is $250 per family. So we're asking you to try and save $250, and we'll be announcing in the future when Mission Sunday will be. And let me just say this. If you're in good financial position, and this does not present a hardship for you at all, and let me repeat that. If you're in good financial position, and what I'm about to tell you does not uh, present a hardship for you, and you would like to give your mission donation in advance of the new date, then that would really help us out. And I would really appreciate you being able to forward that donation at any time. And again, just if you're able to do it. Okay, John chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Jesus is talking here, and here's what Jesus says I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. 
So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, in the Gospel of John and only in John, Jesus makes seven powerful I am statements or I am declarations. And last month, during our I Am series, the teaching series, Pastor Chris and I preached on four of those statements. In lesson number one on Palm Sunday, I am the light of the world. On Easter Sunday, I am the resurrection and the life. Two weeks ago, uh, in lesson number three, Pastor Chris covered I am the vine. And then last Sunday, in what was supposed to be the fourth and final installment, the famous verse from John chapter 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, after further review and with some prayer, and because many of you told us that you've enjoyed this content so much, we've decided to add a bonus fifth installment to the I Am series. And here in John chapter 10, on two different occasions, not just once, but twice, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. That's right, I am the good shepherd. Not just a shepherd, not just an average shepherd, not just the run-of-the-mill shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Now, during his earthly ministry time, the Bible tells us that on one occasion, a very sincere young man came to Jesus and presenting himself before Jesus in a very reverent way, he bowed down on his knees and he asked Jesus a question. This man said to Jesus, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And how many know that's a very good question? What must I do to obtain eternal life? However, before Jesus answered that question or responded to that question, he had a question of his own. Here's what Jesus said. Why do you call me good? Jesus said to this young man, why do you call me good? Now, at first glance, that seems to be a pretty odd question. But I think Jesus really wanted to know if the young man said it in a form of flattery, you know, trying to butter Jesus up to get what he wanted, or if he really understood and knew what he was saying. Because Jesus was, in fact, good. That's precisely how he described himself. That's how he, he identified himself in John chapter 10, the passage we read just a few moments ago. He said, I am the good shepherd. And when he proclaimed that, when he made that statement that I am the good shepherd, every person in the crowd that day knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because the greater majority, majority of them were in agriculture. They grew plants and they raised farm animals, including sheep. And everyone knew with the occupation of shepherding, there were basically two different kinds of shepherds. First, there was the good shepherd or the dedicated shepherd. The one who would stay with the sheep no matter what. He would never bail, never abandon the sheep. The good shepherd watched over the sheep. He cared for the sheep. He protected the sheep all the way to the end. The second kind of a shepherd was the not-so-good shepherd, what we call a hireling. This particular shepherd, he didn't care much about the sheep. And at the first sign of trouble, he would be gone. When danger or adversity approached, he was out of there. He didn't really have the commitment to the sheep that the good shepherd did. And Jesus came right out and he said, wait a minute, everybody. I'm the good shepherd. And with regard to spiritual shepherding, you can count on me. You can put your trust in me. Because I will never leave you or forsake you. 
I will never abandon you. I will guide you and I will take care of you. And if need be, I will lay down my life. I will die for you. And friends, in my heart of hearts, I know Jesus that way. I know him to be good. And over the years, he has proven himself faithful to me. He has never failed me, not once. And no, that doesn't mean that I've lived a charmed life or a trouble-free life. Come on, there's no such thing. Nobody lives that kind of life. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. We're all going to face adversity. But through it all, through the good, the bad, and the ugly, Jesus will not bail on you. And Jesus will continue to reveal himself to you as the good shepherd. And so for the purpose of this message this morning, what I'd like to do is give you three actions or three commitments that Jesus provides for us as the good shepherd. Three actions that Jesus gives to us as the good shepherd. Here they are. Number one, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Number two, the good shepherd lessens the fears of his sheep. And finally, number three, the good shepherd leads the sheep to green pastures. One more time, lays down his life, lessens the fears, and leads the sheep. And this morning, just to switch things up a bit, we're going to look at these in reverse order. So we're going to start with number three and then work our way backwards. Okay, number three. The good shepherd leads the sheep to green pastures. Let me ask you a question. What do sheep love to do more than anything else? You're right. Sheep love to eat. Sheep love to eat and graze all during the day. And you may not be aware of this, but sheep also love to eat and graze during the night. The fact is sheep, they don't sleep much at night. They take a lot of naps during the day, and they only sleep about four hours during the night. The rest of the time, they're looking for food because they love to eat so much. Now, I remember a time in the history of Community Christian Church when I was more than just a little frustrated. This was early on in the church, maybe six months after we started the church, when I began to hear uh, that some people were lodging complaints about the way that we were doing things. You see, early on, um, everybody was excited about the new church plant. And when we came together, people couldn't wait to rally together and, and just meet for church and get excited. But then we learned that there were some unhappy campers. And when you have unhappy campers, that's when the honeymoon season can come to an abrupt end. Now, I don't know all the dynamics associated with what I'm about to tell you, I don't know how this happens, but it just seems to me that all churches have some members who just love to associate and interact with all of the disgruntled people. I mean, it's almost like they have a gift. They're drawn to one another. They find each other. They flock together, and they lodge their complaints uh, as a group. And so when I started to hear about these complaints and a dissatisfaction, uh, as a young pastor, it really bothered me. And I must have been crying out before the Lord one day and voicing and airing out all of my frustrations and maybe even being a little bit of a baby about it when God said to me, Pastor, get a grip. Get a hold of yourself. You should have learned by now that sheep love to talk. It's part of their charm. They do a lot of talking. But here's some advice for you. Here's a secret, Pastor. Sheep love to eat. In fact, sheep love to eat more than they like to talk. And so do yourself a favor. You work on feeding the sheep, and I'll handle the complaint department. You know, that's a lesson that I've never forgotten. And as a shepherd, it's been a beautiful thing to watch church sheep graze and feed on God's word. I mean, to have such a desire to know the word of God and to be able to grow 
in grace and in knowledge and in faith because of God's word. In fact, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how we survive spiritually, by feeding off of God's word. And with face with physical hunger, it was Jesus who said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so the good shepherd always leads sheep to green pastures, to a fresh and rich spiritual place where the word of God comes alive. And I absolutely love the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 61, here's what David said. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call even as my heart grows faint. And here's my cry, Lord. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lord, lead me to a higher place. A place in a position where I can see you high and lifted up. Where I can graze on green pasture where I can know you, where you give me this day my daily bread. So, number three, the good shepherd leads us to green pastures. And then number two, the good shepherd lessens or minimizes our fears. The good shepherd lessens our fears. And it was in Psalm 23, that famous psalm that David said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's what David said. The Lord is my shepherd. He works his way down to verse 4, and he says, Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Can I get you to say that? God, you are with me. One more time. God, you are with me. And knowing that God is with us through the storms of life, he's with us, in the darkness and when the smell of death is all around us, that brings assurance and comfort and a lot less fear. Now, I don't have the time this morning to detail this story out for you. You can find it in 2 Kings chapter 6. In fact, you might want to read about it sometime this week. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the king of Syria, Israel's enemy at the time, was mad at Elisha. I mean, he was ticked. And the reason why he was so mad at Elisha is because God would always reveal to Elisha his plan. And so what the king of Assyria did is he put a hit out on Elisha. He wanted him dead. And when his secret service men found out that Elisha was hiding out in the city of Dotham, he sent the entire army there. And during the night, his army completely surrounded the city. Now, the very next day, Elisha's servant, he went outside early in the morning and he saw the army of Syria there. He ran back into the house. He got a hold of Elisha and he said, Elisha, we're all going to die. The soldiers are just waiting for the king to give the green light and they're going to slaughter, they're going to kill everybody. What are we going to do? Elisha, what are we going to do? And Elisha responded in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 16. Here's what Elisha said. Don't be afraid. Say what? Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. One more time. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be open and he was able to see God's army dwarfing the army of Syria. And now I'm talking about chariots of fire and angels and a force like you wouldn't believe. Psalm 3, verses 1 through 4, says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. I cry to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Don't be afraid. The good shepherd is with us. And they that are with us are more than they that are against us. John, 
the apostle said it this way. Greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. So the good shepherd leads us to a higher place, to green pastures. The good shepherd lessens our fears. And then finally, number three, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And when Jesus said that, when Jesus made that declaration in John chapter 10, was he telling the truth? You better believe he was. Because on Good Friday, Jesus was crucified. And in the days leading up to his death, he said to his disciples, I want you to know, I'm going to be turned over into the hands of sinners and they're going to crucify me. But please understand, nobody takes my life from me. No one's going to force me to go to that cross. I lay my life down willingly. I do it on my own accord because this is something I want to do. You see, Jesus went to the cross because of sin. Jesus died on the cross because of the sins of the world. Remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus came to his baptism. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But keep in mind, Jesus didn't die for his sins. He died for our sins. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that as a man, Jesus was tempted in every way that we are. He faced every single kind of temptation that we face today. But he never succumbed, not even one time. Jesus never sinned. But on the cross, he carried the weight of sin. He carried the tremendous burden of sin. And at some point, he felt the separation that that sin caused. Because on the cross, Jesus made the statement, he quoted the psalmist in Psalm 22, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, at that point, he felt exactly the way we feel when we miss the mark, when we disobey God, when our sins crush our very soul. And so as a result of all that sin, Jesus died a physical death. He died in the same way every other human being on the face of the whole earth dies. But unlike everyone else, on the third day, Jesus was raised to life again. He became a recipient of resurrection life and power. And that power allowed him to overcome death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus completely defeated and decimated sin. And so now as believers, when we lock into that same resurrection, life, and power, and Jesus made it very clear, he said that that power was available to us, that means that we can defeat sin as well. We can overcome temptation. And we can walk in victory. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. For sin shall no longer be your master. I love that last statement. For sin shall no longer be your master. You see, the devil loves to lie to us. And he wants to try and convince us that we will never have victory over sin. That we'll always be slaves to sin. And we'll never be able to overcome temptation. But see, that's not the truth. The Bible tells us that we don't have to be slaves to sin. We have the grace of God that's available to us to be able to overcome temptation and to be able to live according to God's word. And then in addition to lying to us about being subject to sin, uh, the enemy loves to continually remind us of our past failures and our past disappointments. With that, he tries to bring shame and guilt and condemnation. But the Bible's very clear. It keeps pointing us to the good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for us, the one who would not abandon us, but he laid down his life for his sheep. 
And because he shed his blood for our salvation, because he shed his blood for our redemption, we can overcome. We are overcomers. And the Bible says, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We can be victorious because of what the good shepherd has done for us. Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads for prayer, and we're going to begin to prepare for communion. Dear God, we thank you for the good shepherd. We thank you for revealing to us that we have a shepherd in heaven who cares about us. He leads us to green pastures. He desires, Lord God, to lessen our fears. And the good shepherd that we know and the good shepherd that we serve, he lays down his life for his sheep. And so, Lord, we think about these actions. We think about these commitments. And we're so thankful for the communion service. Over the years, as we've participated in communion, we're mindful of what the bread in the cup represents. And we've grown to love the communion service. And we thank you, Lord, for all of the past ministry that has taken place as we gather around the communion table. But Lord, we're asking that this communion service today would be different. We're praying, Lord, that you would grace us, that you would be with us in such an uncommon and unique way that there would be a tangible and personal awareness of our Good Shepherd. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you for caring so much about us. We thank you for watching over us during these difficult days. We thank you that you are so committed to us. And we ask, Lord God, that you would move in a very special way in these next few moments. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I know it's a little challenging to maintain your focus but I'm going to ask you to do the very best that you can to be in an atmosphere of worship during this next song. Please pay close attention to the words and allow the Spirit of God to minister to you. And then I'm going to come back in just a few moments and we'll receive communion together. Behind. 
God, would you forgive us? God, would you forgive us? We all know the answer to that question. It's a resounding yes. In fact, in Psalm 103, again, it was David who said, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. It is the desire of God to free us from our sins. But how many of you know the whole forgiveness process is conditional? And you see this in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, a verse of scripture we've been hearing a lot about these days. God says, if my people, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, if my people would turn from their wicked ways, if they would seek my face, then would I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. In the New Testament, we see the same thing in 1 John 1.9. The apostle said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These verses of scripture, these promises, they contain a huge if. And I firmly believe that the Spirit of God is bringing conviction to sin and turning the if into a when. W-H-E-N. When my people humble themselves. When my people seek my face, when they turn from their ways, then I'll forgive their sins. Then I'll heal their land. You see, on the cross, and I've mentioned this to you on countless occasions, just before Jesus died, he said, it is finished. In other words, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus paid the price. No more blood needs to be shed, not a single ounce. But how many of you know sin doesn't just disappear? You have to confess it. And then we have to repent of it. We have to be willing to change the path we're on. That's what repentance is all about. We talked all about that last week. You know, from my perspective... The most prevalent sin in the church today is not adultery, it's not pornography or homosexuality. It's compromise and complacency. Being on the fence, one foot in, one foot out. What I like to call credit card Christianity. You only take it out of your wallet when you need it. God help us. God lead us to a higher place. Bring us to a position and a place of seeing you as you really are so that we can make a full commitment to you, that we can be your people who are fully devoted to you. The scripture said it was on the night Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, Jesus' body was badly broken. He was beaten. He he was crucified on that cross. And in order to accomplish what he did, he had to be all in. He was all in for you. He was all in for me. It's time for us to become fully devoted to him. Let's take the bread together. After supper had ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and he passed the cup out to his disciples. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. You declare his death. You know, with the death of Jesus, when he shed his blood, he sealed the new covenant. And the cup that you're holding in your hand, whatever it is, it's a covenant cup. And Jesus, when he passed that cup out to his disciples, he made sure every single one of those disciples had that covenant cup in their hand. You see, covenant by relationship means all that I am and all that I have belongs to you. That's what the definition of covenant is all about. It's it's about the way that we relate to each other. And in this whole salvation 
process. Everything that we've been talking about, the commitment on the part of God to forgive us of our sins and to bring us to that place of being in right standing with him, he gave us his best. He gave us his all. He gave us the good shepherd. But we have an assignment as well. We have a part in the covenant. We are to give God our very best. Now, a little over 28 years ago, on February 2nd, 1992, Community Christian Church held our very first service. And on that service, during that service, our special song for that particular day was an old Steve Camp song entitled Consider the Cost. Some of you will remember these lyrics. Consider the cost of building a tower. It's a narrow way that you must come. For to do the will of the Father is to follow the Son. To love him more than father or mother, to love him more than even your own flesh, to give all that you are for all that he is, to give all that you are for all that he is. That's the gospel according to Jesus. Let's take the cup together. Father, again, we thank you for all that you were willing to accomplish for us. And I pray, Lord God, that you would do something deep in our hearts today. Not next week, not next month or next year, but today. That you would help us, Lord, to make a brand new commitment to you that we are all in. That we're going to give you the very best that we have, understanding that as our good shepherd, you gave us the best that you have. Thank you, Lord, for the grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's power, the equipping. Lord, we want and we desire that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's what the scripture tells us. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in our mortal bodies. We yield and surrender our lives to you, and we thank you, Lord, for the finished work of the cross and for all that the communion table represents. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us this morning and thank you for opening your heart to God. I believe that God was doing some really powerful and unique things. And I sure hope that you know how much I miss you. I can't wait to see you. I'm looking forward to seeing you I, I want to buy you a cup of coffee, and don't worry about uh, the lobby. We're going to do the social distancing thing. We're going to bring everybody back. I, I really believe that the worst is behind us, and we have some great days ahead. So keep the faith. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Thank you so much for uh, the cards that you've sent, the notes, the text messages, the social media love. Uh, and thank you so much for your support of Community Christian Church. It means so much to us. Again, God bless you. Have a great week.